power to God is greater than what you do. Life is gift. We are here by the graciousness of God. The incredible all rightness of the way things are. God's house has many rooms. The worst thing
fact that I want something doesn't automatically mean that this is going to come about. How can I live towards a great night yet and image the future as a friend and not as something to fear? That's one of the great issues with which I continue to struggle. Struggle with it intensely uh, in the sickness through which I just passed and now I'm back into the process of having to cope again. And how, how can I get in touch with an authentic energy? What St. Paul says, a hope that does not, does not disappoint. But once again, I'm going to have to rely on memory and I'm going to uh, share with you something that I have shared before. But it was, it was one of those moments of great, great clarity where I was given something that I had never had before. It, I, 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 it was one of those dramatic, those dramatic moments of epiphany where something came to me that was brand new. And it's been foundational as I tried to struggle with the whole prospect of how do I hope. I shared with you that I was born into a typical Southern family, 1930, raised in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, lived life the way Southern white folk, middle class folk lived it. We had one African American lady who lived in our home, cooked our meals, uh, washed our clothes. Uh, in many ways, class was the warmest single person that made up the texture of my childhood. You could absolutely uh, warm your hands by her. She was unlettered. Uh, she was a very simple, primitive kind of person. And yet she was a magnificent hoper, if I could use that term. I used to hear her walking around humming to herself, and I asked her what it was, and it was a little African-American song. Ain't nothing gonna happen today. Ain't nothing gonna happen today. Me and Jesus just can't handle it. It was so simple, not good English, but the incredible, incredible hope. But I was raised in the Southern way of life. I never once sat at table with Gladys. Sometimes everybody else in the family would be gone. She cooks me lunch. She put my lunch on the breakfast at the table. She put her lunch in the kitchen. I begged her to come in and see it. She said, that's not the way we do things here in the South. And I never understood it, but I just grew up with that way of life. And I'm not proud of this, but I, I, I didn't realize the incredible contradiction that the way we were treating people of Pentecost skin, not only kind of did it a national idea, but also heart of the gospel. It, it just didn't, because I, I so was so used to it, it, it didn't really register what the, what a dichotomy this was. I, I went to this little college I told you about in North Carolina, a man named Clarence Jordan came to Religious Empty Week. He's the one that started the Cornelia Farms, out of which Habitat for Humanity has grown. Uh, he was one of the great, great prophetic voices, not terribly well known. One of the great prophetic voices of uh, the middle of the 20th century. And in five days, uh, Clarence Jordan turned my perceptual world upside down, made me realize uh, what I had been a part of and had profited from and still profit from. It gave me a whole new sense of, uh, of the fact that this way of relating is not what God wants. He created for me the famous white man's burden, the, the sense that my kind had been part of the problem. I simply must do what I can in my life to try to be part of the answer. And so that propelled me all through the seminary as I began my path of ministry to try to align myself with, with those that are trying to work for greater racial justice. I went to Louisville, Kentucky, and I there. And I was so anxious to find a way to, to be more humane in the way we related. And uh, we had an organization that tried to bring together black and white uh, ministers to try to understand each other better. We were running a big meeting one afternoon in a conservative synagogue. Uh, there were all different denominations, lots of interests, and we came together. And what I had hoped for that meeting was absolutely dash. 
said, we find our creatures don't know enough to embrace the absolutism of despair. It is humanly speaking presumptuous, and then he said theologically, it is downright heretical. Because if the mystery behind it all can make the things that are from things that are not, forget it, not now. If the mystery can make dead things come alive again, if that one can justify so 
the book quite cool. Uh, Doug is not a stranger to us around here. He uh, led in uh, Dr. Henson's uh, fish shrimp as about three, four years ago, four years ago, and that was when I first met Doug. And uh, it's wonderful to have him back and to have Aaron, whom I haven't met before, uh, to be involved as well. Um, if you look at your bios, you know that Doug is in his 20th year as a full professor at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. He did graduate from Southern Baptist Seminary out across the hill here uh, with a PhD in church history. He worked with Bill Leonard, and of course he worked with uh, Buddy Sheridan and Glenn Henson. And we're very sorry that Buddy Sheridan wasn't able to be with us. Uh, if you look in your packet, well, it's in the plastic bag. Uh, Christian Ethics Today uh, provided us with a special edition, and it includes uh, a number of things written by Buddy Sheridan. So you can look over uh, Buddy's work about John and that. Um, Doug uh, is just getting ready to have published a 500-page book on Baptists and the Holy Spirit, the contested history of the Holiness Pentecostal Charismatic Tradition. And uh, he is a member of Calvary Baptist Church in uh, Waco. Uh, his uh, former pastor was Mary Alice Birdwhistle. She's now a pastor at uh, Highland Baptist Church. And uh, is your book, new book out or already? Well, okay, it's already out. And when I look up uh, of Doug's resume online, what they were have to say about him, what was wonderful about it was that he's a long list of books. So I invite you to do that on your own to look Doug up because there are a number of treasures in what he has written. And of course, he and Aaron are the co-authors of the book, Claypool, that is the centerpiece of today's conversations. Now, Aaron is also a PhD. Does that have, is that a genetic predisposition? <laughs> And uh, some of the books that Aaron has written, um, he has a book on James M. Dunn and Soul Freedom, uh, Stories of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, and then A Baptist Vision of Religious Liberty and Free and Faithful Politics. So we're very honored to have him here, and we look forward to what he has to share with us. John, um, and all of you know really, really well one slice, one church. But in one of the planning sessions, one, one person said, I don't really know anything about when he was at blank. And, and so it was, it was obvious to me at that point in time, we need to do an overview. So 
uh, some of this will be very familiar to all of you, and some of it will not. And so um, we will do that. And we'll do it even if the PowerPoint don't show up. But we I mean, worked really hard on finding those pictures. <laughs> we scoured the internet for these pictures. Um, the genesis of this book really was begun, I think, when I was here for um, the special session for Glenn Henson, who was one of my dear professors uh, and dear friends, and talked to Rowan that day, and uh, he had a, a vision about
negotiate him to come here. That's, that's how that works. So he's, he's negotiating. They've reached out to him. Uh, the one thing that he would tell about his time in Decatur, uh, two things. One, this is uh, where second child Laura Lou was born, uh, so in the hospital in Atlanta. But also, he is a part of a um, ecumenical uh, ministerial group of young ministers, and they get together, and this is where he met Martin Luther King Jr., uh, and they became friends. So he comes to Crescent Hill after one year in Atlanta, and all of, a lot of you in here were part of that. So in the session after this, you're going to have people that come and talk about their particular chapters or their particular experiences. So at, at the risk of saying some things that might steal thunder from other people, uh, I'm only going to mention a couple things about uh, each church. But obviously it was at Crescent Hill from uh, 60 to 71. Um, to put this in the context of American religion and American history, this is the time of, you know, the, of the changing uh, 60s, uh, hippie culture. Uh, it's, it's the time of race and the civil rights movement. And it's also the time in Baptist life of the beginning crisis, supposedly over th theology, with Ralph Elliott's uh, book, The Message of Genesis in 62 and 63, the, uh, the Putting together what's called the Baptist Faith and Message of 63. Also, I, I think it's interesting to remember, though, that what's called the Broadman Commentary Conflict is in 1970, uh, where people get upset that um, a, a commentary on the book of Genesis by G. Hinton Davies from England says in the story of Abraham that God did not. God would have never told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, rather that Abraham heard that, thought that that's what God wanted. But there's controversy, and actually they made that uh, commentary series go away. Uh, the irony of all that is James Sullivan, uh, Claypool's former pastor at the Sunday School Board, would have been involved in all those decisions. And you might remember all that, but Clyde Francisco uh, reissues a second volume of Genesis. So all that's going on while Claypool is pastor here. So you've got some, you got some Baptist conflict going on. You have the civil rights. I'm sure it's going to come up later, but um, his most iconic, most famous picture, I've got a couple pictures that shows him in the different age brackets. So y'all might remember that one. Um, there is a picture of him and the, uh, the family. There you are, Rowan. And then preaching, you have that during this time. And uh, over on the right is the most, what has been called the most famous picture of his ministry. Uh, it's he and King get together. That's a 1961 shot. Uh, they're having coffee. Uh, let me come back to that. Over on the left, uh, he had a radio show that was called, it was, well, he was on a radio show called The Moral Side of the News. If you, when you get into the book, you can read the kind of things he gets involved in. He's heavily involved in interracial um, organizations, ministerial alliances. He becomes a leader in all of these. So during the time he's at Crescent Hill, you need to see the, the young man with a PhD who is establishing his name in Baptist life and in community life. Uh, in 1970, he becomes the, ba the president of the Kentucky Baptist Convention. In 1971, he preaches the convention sermon for the Southern Baptist Convention. So watch, that. that's really fascinating to me because in 69 and 70, you gotta know some Baptist history here, but in 69 and 70, uh, the, the president of the convention was Wally Amos Criswell, W.A. Criswell, extremely conservative person. So that's kind of in the context of the broad, Southern Baptists are acting like they're angry about theology. They've got Criswell in charge. But the very next convention sermon in 71 is given by Claypool, who doesn't match any of that. So you, you kind of got all that going on. Um, during the 60s, uh, we've already seen the, the, his uh, sermon where he talks about despair is presumptuous. And that's a part of that civil rights story. If you remember, the rabbi told him he, he shouldn't say that, even though he felt a little hopeless about the civil rights movement. Um, I think John and, and Alan will do a little bit more with this later, but this picture got him in trouble here at the church. 
and in the community because it was seen to be radical. And this is a really great story about Southern Seminary. Henley Barnett was the one who invited him to speak at Southern Seminary. Uh, Barnett, uh, probably the best, most radical, well, I won't call him best because y'all might have had somebody else, but at least the most radical Christian ethicist to, be, to ever teach at Southern Seminary, Henley Barnett. Um, Pat and I used to live next door to him. Uh, in fact, I should. Aaron went up and did trick or treating in Henley Barnett's house, and, and he gave Barnett gave Aaron some candy. And Barnett says, uh, and Pat says, "What do you say?" Hoping that he was going to say thank you, and Aaron said, "I want more." So, <laughs> you know, anyway, uh, <laughs> but Barnett invites uh, King to speak at chapel. And if you know that whole story, um, it says that about $250,000 in uh, donations were probably lost by the seminary. Yeah, if you're on the Barnett side, uh, and then this is a line that's, that's been written before from Barnett and also Bill Leonard. It's probably the best money that Southern ever spent during that time. Uh, so I'll talk about, so I do want you to think in terms of the Crescent Hill period, y'all have memories. He's establishing himself in Baptist life as a major figure the 30 to 40 year old um, pastor who's everybody's getting to know. He's extremely involved in organizations. He's taking leadership in all that. Uh, Southern Baptists are swirling about theology and also, as you know, race, y'all probably talk about this. You integrate this church. And don't hear me being overly critical. I won't be a little critical of every Baptist church. You integrate this church with, the, uh, with two Nigerians from Southern Seminary, Comfort and Samuel Akande. Um, but notice, Southern Baptists, if, if they integrated, they integrated by having people from other countries who were the product of missionary uh, work. Some churches wouldn't do that. So give you a check, and that's nice, make you feel good, because you did do that. But you're not integrating with African Americans from Kentucky. It's nobody's, hardly anybody's doing it. First that part. comes later. First, uh, it just takes time. Yeah. Akande was from Nigeria, right? Yes. Yeah. I, he was from Nigeria. I grew up in Birmingham, never went to school with the guy. If you go to a, again, I, I don't mind saying it this way, if you go to a church that integrated and brought in a black person, someone who grew up in the South, uh, good, great. Pat yourself on the back, I pat myself on the back. Because almost all the churches that do it first um, are, well, I'll give you the story of Clarence Jordan. Clarence Jordan, if you are, Clarence Jordan is the one who impacted him at uh, Mars Hill. Jordan, uh, Claypool heard, uh, heard Jordan and it transformed. Claypool called his prejudice, genteel, his, uh, his view of race, he called it genteel prejudice. Is that what you had, genteel prejudice? I'm going to start preaching. You had more than genteel prejudice. Come on now. You live in the South and you just had genteel prejudice? Come on, we had a little more than that. A little more than that, and and you see that because churches, most churches didn't want anybody. This church did a good thing. You brought in the Nigerians, and then you eventually bring in the person who's born in the United States. That's that's just part of the story. Uh, so that's why this was so controversial. And he was on the side of, of King. But notice, that's what he says. Despair is presumptuous. He felt despair because churches in the South aren't doing anything. And he wanted to do more. So I do think we can call him prophetic and all that. Uh, he leaves in uh, 71. And you know why he leaves. He, uh, this is a story, and y'all will tell it later. Um, but he leaves because of the death of Laura Lou, the, the acute leukemia. It is the defining moment of his life. The rest of his ministry is preached through the lens of her death. That's how I read that story. Uh, his most famous book, Tracks of a Fellow Struggler, come out of that. As you know, the first three sermons of that book are, t are preached here. The fourth, when he goes to Broadway, what's interesting, um, when he goes to Broadway, 71, 76, he had begun to look at other things. He thought about going to the Peace Corps, and he got turned down. And supposedly he got turned down because the Nixon administration didn't like that he had spoken out against the Vietnam War, 
and because of his, act, his activity in the civil rights movement. Um, to be involved in the Peace Corps as a Baptist was pretty progressive back in that day. Baylor University uh, tried to have a uh, Peace Corps event on campus and the school was denied because the school was still segregated. They only allowed Baylor to have a Peace Corps event after it segregated and it integrated it and integrated it in 63. So the fact that he was interested in the Peace Corps says something about his personality in, in what you might call progressive ministry. I gets called to Broadway. Um, Ryan is here to talk more about the Broadway years. Glenn Jonas is going to talk about that. He moves to it from a, a, a stellar church, which is what you have here, to another one, but in Baptist life it was a mega church. It had 5,000 members. And he said, he, obviously he's moving, he needs to move. Um, you know, psychologically, emotionally, uh, you, you're just going to move after the death of Laura Luke. Uh, but he says he is attracted to the challenge of being in a church that has a lot of wealth. Can I minister to that kind of people? And he also says he just he's, uh, becomes in love with the architecture, the Gothic nature of, of Broadway. And he, he says that. He says that, that also pulled me in as well. Uh, we'll talk, Glenn will talk more about this later. Uh, this is a period in Baptist life. You still have some theology going on. Um, but you also have the, the question of women in leadership, and Glenn, I think, will deal a little bit with that. Uh, so John is partially successful there on that issue. I've got a couple pictures for you just to see what he looks like. Back, we got that. We got the sideburns <laughs> in the '70s. There you go. I had clearly his most famous book, still still worth reading. Uh, Tracks of a fellow. Struggler, the fourth sermon was preached at Broadway, and then the book comes out. Um, one way his preaching has been described is embodied pastoral care. In that preaching, you, if you needed pastoral care, if you needed grief counseling, just sitting in the pews listening to him preach, you got it. And, and that clearly comes out in, in this book and in, and in other books. Uh, and he does, and again, he he's, he's becomes known for this. When you read sermons at his next church, he's uh, Northminster, he's continuously citing uh, not only biblical commentaries, his own reading of the Bible, but he's, he's citing psychologists. John liked to interpret dreams and, and share that in sermons, which not all of you do, but it's quite, quite interesting. Um, this is one of the most fascinating stories. Uh, this is a wonderful church uh, in North Jackson, North Minster Baptist Church. Chuck Poole is the pastor uh, there. And if you've been at, a, at Crescent Hill, which has some size, and then you go to Broadway, which has 5,000 members in Fort Worth, Texas, and then all of a sudden, a church that is brand new, nine years old, and basically, a group of people who didn't want to be a part of First Baptist Church Jackson, young, professional, uh, not afraid to ask the most famous Baptist pastor in the United States outside of the name Billy Graham. And they said, we're going to get him. And they got him. <laughs> and uh, the church is beautiful on the inside. That's the inside uh, recent picture. Uh, it, uh, Kelly Jr., Kelly Williams Jr. is here. I would call it a, uh, a liturgical Baptist church, uh, very reverential worship. I think the organ inside the church, was, which was given by a family there, uh, has been called one of the best two organs in the whole city of Jackson, maybe the best organ in the city of Jackson. I heard that. So the, 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 he, he could go from Crescent Hill to Broadway to uh, Jackson, and continue the kind of worship that fed his soul and where he could feed other people. But people were shocked. How many do you know the people when they're climbing the ladder, they, on appearance, step down the ladder? They go big and then they go small. It's not too many people that do that. And so with a church that has basically 450 people, people, his friends said to him, what in the world are you doing? You are a nut. In fact, one person says to him, 
You have been seduced by the church. That's the language they use. And it's this whole idea that you can go to this little small church and you won't have to fool with administration. You can just preach. You can just teach. You can just write. And they have just fooled you. Um, when he gets there, you really need to find a copy of this. It's, the libraries don't, just don't care it anymore. I tried to get, I used to work at a small school in Georgia, and I got the library to order something called a Wittenberg door. It's, it's Christian sarcasm, but the, the things are so irreverent that the librarian started putting it behind the, t <laughs> behind the desk. Um, he did an interview with the door. Kelly, I'm, I am, I'm pretty convinced that nobody in the church ever knew about the interview when it was going on. Um, yeah, and when it shows up in the book, I have a few people in the church went, oh my gosh, we didn't know this. When he gets there, he says for six months, he walked around going, what in the world did I do? I have, I, have I made a mistake? And uh, he said people in the church would say to him, we can't figure out why you came here. <laughs> it's this wonderful story. But he does say at the end of six months, he said, I'm really, really happy to be here. Uh, but it wasn't, you, you got to think about this in terms of Baptist culture. To go from a church from 5,000 voluntarily to a church with 450, just unheard of. It's almost unheard of. Uh, but it, is, it really is a wonderful church. And the thing about this, if, if you think about Crescent Hill, I can't talk to you about your time with Burhan, but it's clearly, I think he helped at least, if you already were doing it, he clearly helped establish the progressive nature of this church. I don't have any doubt saying that. Uh, when he went to Northminster, he did not have to do that. Northminster were young professionals who were open, who were ecumenical, they met in an old synagogue. And even today, if you want to talk about Baptist life and being progressive, they have an extremely close relationship with Beth Israel, the Jewish synagogue in, in Jackson. I mean, how many, so think about that. I don't know about the Episcopalians here, but how many Baptists really do that even today in 2022? So this church had this really progressive feel to it. Now, it also had unique tensions in it. It's Mississippi. By the way, my dad's from Mississippi, so I say this out of love. And so there are people there that are really, really activists on civil rights, and there's some hardcore resistance on civil rights. And that was in the same church. The same church. Uh, the very first Republican candidate for, pres uh, for uh, governor in Mississippi, when it was unheard of for a Republican to run, was a prominent member of Northminster. So it's this unique church. And, and John goes there and, and he, he flourishes there. I don't think there's any, any doubt about that. Uh, dearly beloved at the church. <clears throat> what I want you to see, he's going to shift to an Episcopal identity soon, but he, he is simply Mr. Progressive Baptist. When he was at Fort Worth, he wrote for the Baptist Standard, the Texas paper. He was involved in the Tarrant Baptist Association. He went to Baylor, and Baylor loved him. He would go to students. He was Mr. Progressive Baptist. He was Mr. Progressive Baptist. That's who he was. And, and so here, he's heavily involved on the left side. He's heavily involved in what's called this uh, Southern Baptist, uh, oh, it's, it's called the uh, uh, CLC, Christian Life Commission, which would have been maybe the most progressive uh, agency of the SBC, probably in the 60s and 70s, Foy Valentine and that kind of thing. You might have heard those names. I don't know. This book meant a lot to me uh, when I preached a lot. Uh, this comes out during this period. It's called Stages. He talks about, this shows some of his psychology in his preaching, but he talks about the different stages of life. Uh, Sheridan really likes the last chapter, which would have been older than him when you become a senior, but this comes out during this time. I do want to mention this book. Now, this might be his most famous academic book. Most of his books are dearly beloved because they are sermons and they still speak to you today. Uh, this one was the, uh, based on the Lyman Beecher Lectures. He is asked to, to give the uh, Beecher Lectures at Yale University. 
And he's the third Southern Baptist in the 100 year history of them um, to ever give them. And he has this fascinating story he relates about how he gets ready to prepare for the lectures and he can't write anything. He gets writer's block, which you know, is kind of hard to, to figure, but he does. And, and then he says, I had a mystical, uh, see if this resonates with the John Claypool you know, I had a mystical experience, a mystical impression. And he heard God telling him, John, we really wanted Jesus Christ to deliver these lectures, not you. <laughs> But he's, he's occupied, so we'll take you instead. And so he said that he had what he called a mutual collaboration or a dance where he began to write the lectures and he, he, he came out with it. He did not say they were divinely inspired, but he said there was this mutual collaboration with the divine when he writes the lectures. What's fascinating about that, some of the material in the lectures is not new. He had used some of that material before. But he puts it all together uh, in, in, a, in a very, very good book about preaching, Aaron's going to mention this in a minute ago, one of the things he gets known for is not only his ecumenism, but his confessional preaching. He used that. In fact, um, I'm Steve, if you just got real, real honest, Shoemaker, if confessional preaching among homileticians is controversial. In fact, he admitted that. He says, I know there can be a danger in doing this. It can be exhibitionist, I know that, but this is what saved me. And so but he embodies grief counseling in preaching. And, and so he, began, he talks about that in here. I will tell you this. This is a trick of academics. When he preaches at Northminster, Kelly, about this book, he said it was a mystical impression. When you read the book, the word mystical is not in the book. <laughs> he took it out. Maybe an editor take it, took it out, didn't I don't know. It's, it's fascinating to see that. So that comes out of this period. Um, it is a, a, a crisis moment in his life. Uh, Bill Hull said he, there was a death of a child with Laura Lou. There's a death of a marriage. When he leaves Northminster in 81, he goes to uh, <clears throat> New Orleans and it takes a year uh, in clinical pastoral care. He takes a year to help take care of himself. Uh, when he left Northminster, he calls it a seam in his ministry, but he admits to the church, and these sermons are really, really worth reading, he admits to the church that he had uh, failed, that he had had marital failure. Uh, he never uses the word marital failure. He says, I have relational difficulties. And he says, I, I'm 50 years old, I can't, this is what's happening to me, but he, he's very, very honest about it. When he goes to New Orleans, uh, his wife, Luann, goes back to Fort Worth and lives in Fort Worth. Um, out of that experience, he uh, has a very good friend in Lubbock. Hardy Clemens becomes a major figure in the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. And um, Clemens, in some ways, gives him what he calls institutional grace. And he becomes a co-pastor with Clemens for three years uh, there. And it's during this time, if you see some pictures, it's during this time that he writes, this is the book that has more of the autobiographical reflections. <clears throat> I encourage you to read it. I describe it. I want to be a little nicer to him than he's to himself. I, he, in this book, he says, you know, I had mixed motives. Uh, I really was the BSU president at Mars Hill because it would give me prestige. Well, how, how many of you, when you were 20, didn't have mixed motives? So, I mean, I want to give him a little bit of a break. But he also talks about his, his loving but very conflicted relationship with his mother in this book. Uh, and I won't go into that now. I do describe it in the book. Um, and he does pretty much say that his mother really accepted him only when he was successful. And that's why he wanted to be president of the United States. But he also said that that's what causes him to have burnout in Fort Worth and in Jackson. Because he was always trying to be the rescuer of everybody else and not take care of himself. It's quite revealing. I do describe it, but and there's more of it in that book. Um, I've just had pictures here. He begins to, to put together a lot of sermons during this period. The Light Within You is his longest book of sermons uh, comes out. 
while he's in Lubbock. And it's a unique time in Lubbock uh, with he and Hardy Clemens. They, they get along really, really well. Uh, this is the period where he begins the journey to the Episcopal uh, tradition, uh, meets with a lot of uh, pastors. The, uh, uh, the bishop out in West Texas says that Clemens and Claypool are more Episcopal than they are Baptists. Uh, even though they are bad, so they're very, very ecumenical during that time. And we talk about that in the book. Uh, he has his longest ministry at any one church when he, uh, he does get ordained as an Episcopal priest and he is called by St. Luke's. Um, I need to do this quickly. I want to turn it back over to Aaron. But for all of you, when you set up a list of, uh, y'all just called it your co-pastor, when you set up a list and it's this unrealistic list and you go, well, Jesus couldn't even fulfill that. <laughs> y'all ever heard of that? <laughs> well, there's this great story about St. Luke's that they're, John Claypool is recommended to them. And first they're going to go, well, who is he? And then the, they find out, wow, he's this great preacher, he's this great teacher. But they have, they have hesitations about him. Number one, he was older than they wanted for a pastor. Number two, he had just gotten a divorce. That was, and while Baptists were horrible on that, they still had hesitations about that. Um, he also, they said that he had been going psychiatric care and depression, which he was honest about, but they, they had some questions about that. And it basically just wasn't known to them. And a man named Hank Meyer, this is a wonderful story, basically tells this, uh, the vestry, he says, how can you have somebody deal with your brokenness if that person hasn't experienced brokenness themselves? And so there's this Henry now and a word, a wounded healer, and, and Claypool becomes the wounded healer, and he gets called to St. Luke's. He has a wonderful time there, as you know. And there you are, St. Anne, affectionately known as St. Anne in Birmingham, quite the career, uh, licensed psychotherapist, clinical social worker, ends up on the faculty at uh, Alabama, Birmingham, in uh, there in town, and so, uh, Sidekick together, Thank, and I really appreciate you coming, by the way. Uh, just some pictures, and we saw the video a little while ago uh, during this period. I, do you have some more books during this time? And he writes, again, a lot of sermons are put together, stories that Jesus tells in 93. Uh, God is an amateur. For all you preachers, I want you to know there's, it's always okay to preach a sermon twice because this is a book from his Episcopal tradition era, but he has a sermon from Northminster, Kelly, entitled God and the Amateur. And basically what that means is not someone who's naive, but it's someone who does something out of the sheer joy of it, the celebration. But it's one of his uh, more provocative good sermons, I think. Uh, Men in the Heart, 99. The Hopeful Heart, 2003. The Ingenious Alchemist, already I did read that sermon from Northminster as well, 2005. And we do have uh, Anne, to be grateful for this, she puts together a uh, book of sermons on the apostles uh, three years after John died. After he retires, he heads to McAfee. Aaron's going to have some quotations from those students. Uh, and he is a re he's retired and not retired, but the students there love him. They call him the legend in residence, and he's uh, is a preaching professor there. Lloyd accused him of giving A's to everybody. So. Uh, Claypool got six honorary degrees, the last one being at Wake Forest uh, School of Divinity, and you can tell there, there might be some, uh, some cancer going on in that picture. Uh, we've already seen that book, which has a lot of tidbits about him, and I'm going to turn it back over to Aaron, who's going to talk about some of the impact. So my first encounter with John Claypool was doing this book. Um, and in doing this book, I worked for the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, worked there for almost 10 years. We were working on this book around 2015, 2016. And I came to learn through the executive coordinator at the time, Susie Painter, uh, connections to all of these people um, that I knew that I worked with on a daily basis who had been deeply influenced by John Claypool. And it just opened up a lot of different conversations uh, that made this project very fulfilling as well as, as this project, Claypool. And the conversations have continued today. So when I wrote my epilogue for this book, um, I attempted to share uh, reflections from mostly cooperative Baptists uh, that spoke to what I believe are Claypool's uh, most significant contributions, which is the affirmation and advocacy for the full equality of black women and men and confessional preaching. 
Um, I don't really want to put an emphasis there on advocacy because I had come across Claypool very briefly when I was doing some dissertation research around Foy Valentine, uh, James Dunn, the history of the Christian Life Commission, and there was a lot of affirmation. Southern Baptists resolved that they affirmed the equality and dignity of black women and men, but there was not a lot of advocacy. And of course, Claypool was in that small group of Baptist dissenters that really helped move the tradition, the progressive tradition forward. All right, so I wanna share, uh, to conclude this for y'all, a handful of quotes that are in the book and not in the book, some came later, uh, that I found very impactful. One is from my good friend, uh, former CBF colleague, Ryan Clark. Ryan was a student and colleague of Claypool's at McAfee. Uh, he also served in the Philippines as a CBF missionary for a handful of years. And his quote really resonated. He said, do I really want pastors to be real people? As a Gen Xer, I think the Baptist church would be much stronger today if we'd been able to retain more like Claypool who are willing to stumble a little harder into authenticity. So another quote here, uh, another friend, Jody Long, who's currently uh, heads up the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship of Georgia. Uh, he was another student, I believe after Ryan, at, at McAfee. And he writes, during my third year at McAfee School of Theology, as John was dealing with his own cancer, my father was struggling with cancer too. Every week before each class, John would pull me aside and ask if I had talked to my father. On the days when I would sheepishly reply, no, sir, he would not let me come to class until I had called and checked in on my dad. And this is a, a one that I got, it's not in the epilogue, that I got very recently from um, talking in the office with colleagues uh, about this book. I've made connections with people who were deeply influenced by uh, John Claypool. Nell Green, she's a current colleague. She served overseas for 20 years as a CBF missionary. Um, she actually did not discover John Claypool until she came back to the States. She was in uh, Houston, I think maybe Tallawood Baptist Church, and they're reading uh, Claypool in a Sunday school class. She read Stories Jesus Still Tells, and she was hooked. And so she says, I knew it related to a gracious, generous, loving God. As a fan of Foster, Willard, and Peterson, I knew there were those who taught and encouraged people to know this God rather than a vengeful, angry God. Claypool's ability to put Jesus' teachings into simple, relatable context brought these stories alive for me and redirected my thinking on them. I found the God I knew. And Nell told me recently that she, she really wished that she had known of Claypool uh, much earlier. And she's read a number of his books since. Another colleague I had a great conversation with uh, very recently uh, about this book, uh, Ricky Letson. He is a, he works for CBF now, but previously a pastor in South Carolina. And he shared with me that he first encountered Claypool during his undergraduate days at Samford in Birmingham uh, while Claypool was at St. Luke's. And he indicated that Claypool was a presence on campus with some of his uh, religion professor colleagues, and he was able to interact with them that way. But while he was a student at Duke Divinity, he said Claypool became a big influence on his ministry journey, an influence that still continues today. Uh, John Claypool's sermons captivated me, particularly Claypool's storytelling and use of his own life experiences. To this day, I am shaped by the life and ministry of John Claypool. Even though I've read all of his books multiple times, every year I pull one or two off the shelf, reread them, and once again benefit from his depth and wisdom. And so the last one is Claypool Benediction, and I was, I was talking to another colleague who is uh, younger than me, mid-30s, uh, Emily Holiday. She's now a young pastor in Maryland. She previously served in Louisville. And she said that she fashioned her own benediction from that of her friend, uh, Jason Crosby recent pastor here at Crescent Hill. Uh, Crosby had himself drawn from Claypool's famous benediction. Uh, Emily graduated from McAfee a decade after Claypool's death. So it, it just in all the conversations I've had, I wonder, um, and maybe David will talk about this later, uh, how many pastors are closing worship services week in and week out with a benediction that is descended from, derived, influenced by uh, Claypool's benediction. Buddy Sheridan likes to say, if you have one word to talk about John Claypool, he uses Baptipalian. 
I add Episcopal Baptist. I wrote a very end of a chapter before I got the chapter from Julie Whittenlong and Lloyd Allen, and Lloyd makes the case, and I am convinced this is right, that the only way you understand the last you know, 15, 20 years of John Claypool's life is to understand that he was in the Episcopal tradition. And so he, Baptists love having him come back, but he didn't come back as a Baptist. He came back with an appreciation for his past, but he came back as an Episcopal priest. And I think the best way to say that is that he found comfort and peace and a gift to him and a gift to all of his churches. Remember, he was a, he was a pastor who embodied pastoral care and he found it in the Eucharist. And there's this provocative line when he was sick, he basically says, the Eucharist is like chemotherapy. It's something I don't deserve outside my body put inside my body to make me better. And he saw the Eucharist as the fulfillment of an experience of grace, and it's something that he loved doing himself and he wanted to share with others. So a Baptipalian, Episcopal Baptist, Baptist, Episcopal, everybody's grateful for John Claypool. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doug and Aaron. We really appreciate it. Um, I would like to say we're going to take a break in just a minute, and we have about 15 minutes. But when we reconvene for the panel, we will be in the sanctuary. And um, Carolyn wanted to uh, do something that she'd intended to do. So, Carolyn. Thank you. I neglected to introduce Bishop. Henry Parsley, would you please stand up? Were you the bishop when John was uh, called? No, it was. Uh, no. He was called before I became the bishop, so he was right there playing with us when I got the first game. So Henry's come from Wilmington, and he's so important um, <clears throat> to the Episcopal Church. Mark Ligori, who's also here. <laughs> Mark worked with John at St. Luke's <clears throat> for many years, and I've, the residue of John, he carries that around with him in his preaching and in the way he treats people. Mac Moore is here from Birmingham. I know George um, Salem was supposed to be here, and my dear and beloved husband, Will Ratliff. So we are the Episcopal um, representatives here, and I just didn't want to overlook that. Thank you for coming. Uh, our Episcopal friends, you're a gift uh, to this event. All right, let's go take a break. <laughs>